Hey everyone, before we get to today's episode, I want to tell you about a fantastic event that I'm excited to be part of. It's the first annual Tate Behavioral Conference, which will be held on October 25th in Springfield, Massachusetts. It'll feature presentations by podcast favorites like Megan Miller, Ryan O'Donnell, and Kim Barons. I'll be doing my own talk as well, and we'll close out the day with a live recording of my interview with Dr. Kim herself. For more information, go to behavioralobservations.com forward slash Tate 2019. Springfield, Mass. is a short drive from many parts of the Northeast, so I hope to see you there. Okay, on to today's show. I'm really excited to have Dr. Steve Hayes come back on the podcast. We begin the show with a quick tutorial of sorts on relational frame theory, as well as its relationship with acceptance and commitment therapy. We then spend quite a bit of time discussing the use of ACT in the context of preventing and responding to staff burnout. We also discuss managing quote-unquote difficult people, optimizing staff performance, as well as other aspects of management and supervision. Throughout the interview, we discuss his newest book, which is called A Liberated Mind, How to Pivot Towards What Really Matters. To be candid, to say that this book is a big deal is a bit of an understatement. As Steve explains, A Liberated Mind is being published by one of the largest publishing houses in the world, which means that our science will have an opportunity to be disseminated in a way that we haven't seen before. There are many take-home lessons from this conversation, so I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. The show notes of this episode has links to where you can learn more about A Liberated Mind, as well as many other topics we covered. Before we get to the interview, I want to let you know that this episode is brought to you by Behavior University. Behavior University provides university-quality continuing education for everyday practitioners. To learn more about their CE offerings, please visit behavioruniversity.com forward slash observations. We're also brought to you by Go Lotus. Go Lotus is an intuitive and easy-to-use practice management system. It handles every aspect of practice management, from data collection to scheduling billing and much, much more. It's so simple, your entire team can be up and running in less than an hour. So for more information and to learn more about podcast-specific discounts and freebies, go to golotus.com forward slash register. Okay, I think that's enough for now. So without any further delay, please enjoy this fun conversation with Dr. Stephen Hayes. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now here's your host, Matt Sicoria. Dr. Steve Hayes, welcome back to the Behavioral Observations Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. And it's uh, just awesome to be back uh, with you again. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I re-listened to our conversation from last year. It was your birthday in which we uh, had that interview, which uh, <laughs> I forgot about until I re-listened to that. I was like, oh my gosh, he spent his 70th birthday talking to little old me. And uh, yeah, it was, it was fantastic. And uh, here we are um, almost to the day a year later. And uh, yet we're talking about a, a, a yet another book. So um, yeah, uh, yeah. So just uh, just generally welcome to the show. I'm glad glad you're able to come back. Um, I'm pleased to be here, and I'm glad it's not this time actually on my birthday. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, <laughs> my wife will be happier with me. Yeah, that, that's uh, that's 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 <laughs> sure. That would be the case in my household for, uh, too. So. Uh, I figured I'd just start uh, by asking you um, what's been happening with Steve Hayes, and I guess in the last twelve months. You know, at the last time we chatted, you had the uh, the Evolution book coming out, and uh, yeah. I also think Praxis was rolling out some ACT boot camps for behavior yeah. analysts and things like that. So, it, and and I know there's been a few uh, iterations of those in, in since the last time we talked. So, uh, tell me a little bit about uh, the last year and what's been going on with you. Well, a lot of things are coming together, Matt. I mean, we're really kind of seeing the work mature. And I think when we talked last, the ABAI had just had that special day on ACT and RFT. And you know, there's some controversy about that. There was again this year. But what is happening, you know, with the evolution uh, book and now another one that's coming out in October on applying ACT and evolutionary science and CBS together to create this thing called pro-social. Really what I'm actively doing is trying to make a marriage happen that uh, Skinner tried to make happen uh, towards the last decade of his life and wasn't able to pull off. It wasn't just his fault. Evolutionary science wasn't ready to receive the message that 
variation and selection within the lifetime of an individual is a le- legitimate evolutionary stream. And I think just in every day, uh, I, I see more and more indications that an extended evolutionary synthesis that puts learning at the center is um, headed towards a mainstream view. We're not there, no, never near there. But that's so exciting for behavior analysis and for behavioral psychology because we were the ones who sang that song first, and now it's actually coming to fruition. So I'm excited about that. And I, and then the other thing I'm kind of excited about, there's a couple of things that are happening, is that I've been working with colleagues in cognitive behavior therapy, especially Stefan Hoffman, my good friend, and an early opponent of ACT and a very kind of traditional CBT guy. He and I have sort of made an alliance around what we're calling process-based CBT, which really is CBT, I can say it this way, I don't know if Stefan would like this way, but CBT thought of the way a behavior analyst would think of it, meaning process-based, kind of functional analytically oriented. And it's starting to really move uh, the CBT universe and so uh, that's exciting uh, to see a coming together of some of the kind of meta theoretical and strategic visions, this ideographic process focused vision that's always been in behavior analysis, entering into the mainstream CBT in a different way. And then finally, there's uh, uh, this uh, big book, and there was a, an online course I just released, both of which are my attempt at my age, which we started out with. You know, since my 70th was a year ago, guess what I am now? <laughs> <clears throat> uh, old is the answer. <laughs> but, uh, I'll just leave uh, that there, yeah. Uh, uh, but, you know, uh, I'm stepping forward and trying to put some things out there in terms of the online course called Act Immersion. And um, uh, people can go to my website, stephenchayes.com on that. But And this book, which is with uh, one of the big five publishers, it's with Penguin uh, Avery, part of Random House, and uh, really is an attempt to put the science of psychological flexibility, its behavioral roots, the whole journey that we that I've been on personally and as a science team uh, into the popular culture and, and, and to share the fruits of that uh, so that policymakers, parents, uh, you know, people trying to lose weight or do better at sport or deal with depression or anxiety or substance use and on and on, all these kinds of things, uh, can have a book available that sort of bumps them in the right direction and also orients them towards how we might take advantage of what has been learned over the last 40 uh, years of uh, a science effort inside the face of behavior analysis that's called contextual behavioral science. Awesome. You know, the publisher was kind enough to send me an advanced copy of it. And oh, cool. I've been, yeah, I've dug into it quite a bit, and it, it is quite comprehensive. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, it's uh, definitely, but it's also, uh, as you clearly state in the forward or introduction or whatever, it's aimed at, it, it's written very accessibly at the same time. So I think that is a quite the needle to thread there. So uh, we can get more into the book. Uh, as we as we chat here, and I definitely have some questions related to that as, as we go on. But uh, what I'd like to do is kind of put the car in reverse metaphorically here and sure. uh, go back to some basic starting points. You know, I, I generally, when I interview people, I'll uh, put out a call to questions to my listeners. And I had a, a number of questions. I usually kind of feature these questions towards the end of the interviews, but these questions were more fundamental in nature and i thought let's you know let's just let's just get them out of the way or not get them out of the way yeah. as, as if to dispense with them but let's 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 take them on right yeah. away to kind of set the context for the rest of the discussion Perfect. Here. um so uh I, here we go and you um so uh, <laughs> what is the uh, uh what's the simplest way to describe relational frame theory especially in contrast to more traditional behavioral approaches to language development. And that's written in by a, a longtime listener who's been a behavior analyst for decades, uh, who, yeah. is, is, who you know, uh, is, is very skeptical and has actually had uh, a lot of UNR grads try to explain this to him, and he's still, <laughs> still scratching his head over it. So you know, Well, skepticism is a really awesome thing, and we do have to follow the evidence. And boy, I, there's some evidence coming that just 
kick ass. I mean, and so we're getting very, very, very close to being able to have direct head to head, really well done comparisons of uh, Skinnerian verbal operands uh, versus, if you want to say the word versus, uh, Skinnerian verbal, verbal operands plus a whole RFT bit of training with, for example, children with developmental disabilities. And the outcomes are spectacularly different. And so we're entering into an area where it doesn't just, it's just not an academic conversation anymore. And that's up to people to make that decision. I'm not trying to bully anybody with that. I'm just saying the data are there and more and more are coming out of peak uh, program and some of the other things. But the, the quick and dirty thing is that, uh, you know, Skinner basically with verbal operants uh, uh, took the three major things that are unique not unique, but characteristic of human beings, which are culture, cognition, and cooperation, and, and basically nominated culture as the, as the core. And it's not said that way, but it's really, uh, after all, uh, you know, a, a verbal operant is something that even a non-human animal can show. Skinner points out in one of his footnotes, it has not escaped my attention that the interaction between an experimenter and a non-human animal comprises a small but genuine verbal community. Why? Because it meets this full definition of verbal behavior, but it requires special training of the audience in order to mediate reinforcement, right? And that basically means culture. So the verbal culture is what's at the source of cognition and through that, the amplification of cultural processes because of our verbal abilities. Relational frame theory starts with cooperation. It says, no, what's special about us, those three things, yes, but we're cooperative because of multi-level selection, because we're, uh, we evolved in small bands and troops. Yeah, was, Skinner talks about that, by the way. But because of that, uh, multi-level selection uh, allowed a uh, particular kind of cooperative uh, acts to be selected. And uh, there's a lot of evidence that uh, human beings and hominins presu presumably were like this are pretty good at relational learning of, that are physically based on properties. But I think what happened here is that, to, in a short version, is that uh, we essentially uh, kind of invented, it's a mentalistic way to say it, but we'll do it anyway, uh, stimulus equivalents. That emerged out of uh, the social cooperation between a speaker and a listener because of the perspective taking skills that are not verbal, that are required of us in order to really function well in small bands and troops for cooperation and understanding the purposes of others around us is so strong. Non-human infants are weak at that. Human infants are really good at it. You know, they, our, our bodies even evolved to do it, whites around our eyes and so forth. The children are following what we're doing, you know, social referencing, joint attention, all these kind of processes that are intensely social. So the way I show this in workshops is I hold up an object. I say, make a sound. person makes a sound. And I've held up, let's say, a clicker. And some, somebody says, ah. And then I give the clicker to somebody. And I reach out my hand and I say, ah. And they give me the clicker. Well, of course they would. And it's simply taking from the point of view of the listener, the perspective of the speaker, if I say, ah, in that context, with my hand out, I surely want to receive the object. Yeah, but Matt, you know that we're the only animal that clearly, it's still arguing about it, shows if you have a, an object and give it a name, whether that's a gesture or a plastic chip or a sound, when you then, quote, hear that name, you provide the object. And that's bidirectional naming, some people want to call that now, uh, Doug Greer's kind of stuff, or whatever it is, we know it's a cusp. And here's the RFT take on that. It's actually a relational act. A relational act in the sense of, if I ask you who your relations are, you know, I mean your family. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a social act. And from that, if you can do, uh, from the point of view of the speaker, this is an ah. From the point of view of a li listener, an ah is this. And you can do that without 
uh, special training because of the kind of cooperative species we are, it then gives us the capacity to extend out that to other relations. For example, if I'm bigger than you, you know that you're smaller than me. You know, from the point of view of, of me looking at you, uh, you're smaller. From the point of view looking at me, I'm bigger. And in the same way in language training, being able to, let's say, have name, object, object, name, pretty soon gives you unfamiliar name, unfamiliar object, gives you uh, unfamiliar object, now known name, the process of exclusion. That's a relation of difference. And that happens only a couple months after bidirectional naming happens, around 12 months old in uh, human uh, infancy. So there we are off to the races with a relation of difference now and same or coordination and distinction of RFT talk from which you quickly get to opposition. You know, warm is the opposite of cool, but boiling is the opposite of freezing where you have a a nonverbal dimension along which you can place degrees of difference. And I just mentioned the comparison one. And because these are arbitrarily applicable, they come under uh, control of social cues, not just by the form of the related events. And so that, you know, if I'm bigger than you, you're smaller than me thing, comes into the control of things like bigger than. And you look at what happens when you're three and four when a kid can say a dime is bigger than a nickel. That's a profound moment. A dime is not freaking bigger than a nickel. But the kid, having never spent the dime ever, will fight for the dime over the nickel once bigger than has its arbitrary form. Now, the implication is, if I can cut to the chase, language is not associative. It's not based on pairing. It's not based on formal similarity. Some of those processes can enter into the early work, operant classical conditioning can include things you might want to call associative. But it breaks free from that and becomes relational. It starts with the relation of a speaker and a listener, but it ends up into other kinds of relations. And why that matters? Well, the way I usually show this is that I'll show a picture of a family and say, if everybody's related to everybody else in this picture, uh, how many possible relations could you derive if a new person comes in and says, hey, I'm Fred's cousin? And it's a ginormous number of relationships. But if you want to compare that to association, I say, and what would happen if that same person came in, shook someone's hand, left the room, and then the CDC came in and said, hey, they have a dread disease. Who shook their hand? That's association. And a metaphor for it. And the, because it's physical proximity, one thing touching another, right? The implications of relational learning are multiplicative. And the implications of associative learning are not because bidirectionality, combinatorial properties and really in associative learning are very weak and arguably even non-absent when you go, I mean, non-present when you go to a few backward associations, for example, it goes to zero. People don't even know if it exists after a hundred years of trying to find it. So thinking of language as relational learning, and then just add this simple idea, it's an operant. It's operant relational learning. It starts from things that are probably just built into our uh, cooperative nature. Uh, Gives you an incredible engine for new things, but it also challenges you now with a problem because everything can be related to everything else in all possible ways. And this is easy to test. Just think of two objects. Think of any relation you want. Anything is the father of, is better than, uh, you know, is the weird next of kin of. I mean, you make up a relation that's as weird as you can think of and then ask yourself the question, how is this object, whatever you pick, related to that one in that way? And you're going to find an answer every single time. So either everything is related to everything else or this is an illusion of mind. And I'm using the word mind deliberately. That collection of relational abilities and generating and following rules that I think then gives us cognition and uh, uh, culture in this new way. So cooperation came first and uh, 
uh, cognition is relation, not association, and it's a learned operant. It's a pretty simple idea, but boy, does it have big implications. Sorry for the long rant, but I hope that helped your your, your uh, listener. Yeah, I'm sure Bob will email me and uh, let me know. So uh, he's he's good about doing that. Um, what is the... Could I say just one thing, though? Oh, yeah, yeah, go keep going. Yeah. The kind of skeptical voices that happen inside ABA, it's really cool. Ask the question, let's go for it, and data trumps all. If you want to say, oh, yeah, but I can find it in the in Skinner 57, I'd say, dude, okay, this is a 60-plus-year-old book. How come the programs that make the changes came out of the RFT book? If you think it's so clear that it's in the verbal behavior, why was the program not there? So I get a little cross. I'm not I'm guessing that I'm just guessing. I'm just saying skepticism is fine. Cynicism isn't. And let's allow new things to happen if they pass the empirical test. And yeah. so with much skepticism people want to bring to it, I'm cool. Just as long as that bottom line is there. Give me, yeah. a, give me a study where I could test the difference and look at the studies that have been done. Rant well, over. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is there, is a, is there a, a specific study or a program of, uh, uh, or a handful of them that you could direct? Uh, well, for, for I, BCBAs, I know, yeah. I, I'm willing to let RC, RFT stand or fall on the basis of peak. I can make it as simple as you can possibly get. Look at Mark Dixon's four books, and you look at volume one and volume two are darn good training programs and verbal operants. I think anyone looking at that would say that's a pretty good effort. Now look at volume three and volume four, which is equivalence and multiple stimulus relations. And so here's, uh, here's my test. If volume three and four don't add to one and two, kill RFT forever. Pretty simple test, dude. Pretty simple test. So, go for it. And and uh, you know and and I, you know when the RFT book came out, we listed twenty five ways you could disprove it. And so that's back in two thousand and one. We've stepped up over and over again, saying what the, what is the empirical claim? What is the basis? What is missing? And now, you know, how many years later, we have three four hundred studies on these things and a bunch of these missing items have been answered and still to this moment there's not one single sour empirical note not one so either you got to show it's conceptually impossible or that you can do all the same things actually do it without a use of that or you name a study that hasn't been done yet or a eh, well time's up or uh, I think you're hanging on a little bit too tightly to our traditions at the expense of new data. Are you in need of continuing education? Well, Behavior University is a BACB approved continuing ed provider, and their mission is to provide university quality courses and ABA for new and experienced professionals alike. Their live webinars generally have a limited number of attendees so that the learning experience is highly interactive. And if you can't make the live events, these webinars are recorded and available in Behavior University's CEU library for later viewing. Behavior University also has a 40-hour RBT training. This self-paced course uses a combination of visual presentation, audio lectures, and live video models to teach all areas of the RBT task list. The course is accessible anytime and from anywhere. So if you'd like to learn more, head on over to behavioruniversity.com forward slash observations, where you'll find a 10% discount for podcast listeners. Again, that's behavioruniversity.com forward slash observations. And thanks for checking them out. All right. All right. Um, Let me do that, man. Hey, no problem. Uh, I'm probably offending would... people massively. Uh, you know what? You know, hey, you know, it is what it is. I've... Uh, um, uh, let's see. I've got a couple other kind of fundamental yeah. questions or principle-based questions, I suppose, or, or just curiosities here that um, both folks have written in and I've kind of added to. Um, let's see. Uh, so what is that? I get that I'm, I'm using this word handoff or what's the relationship between RFT and ACT? Um, I, I'm sure there's plenty of ACT practitioners, particularly coming to ACT from yeah. different types of 
disciplines, if you will, I'm thinking, uh, you know, licensed clinical social workers, et cetera, who, who may not be versed sure. in RFT and things like that. But, you know, as, as behavior analysts, you know, what, what is the connection between the specific relational frames and then the act processes and things and psychological flexibility, you know, so yeah, if you yeah. kind of connect those dots for me a little bit. I think that would be. Well, helpful. there's a rich and deep set of connections. They co-evolved. It isn't the case that RFT was fully developed and then boom, act came out. That kind of bottom up thing, you know, was fine when we were dealing with animal learning processes that we'd spent decades developing. But then, you know, when, after we applied those things, who's going to develop the new basic things? And what the RFT community did, what the CBS side of, the, of uh, behavior analysis does is say, okay, the model is reticulated. It's not bottom up. And what that means is that everybody's responsible. If we don't have enough basic principles, get about the business of developing them. Even if you're an applied behavior analyst, do the basic work. Not everybody has to do that, but at least just enough that we don't just have holes in our basic data and say, well, that's the responsibility of JAB people. That's just wrong. You don't tag somebody else with your questions. If you can't get them answered, you go answer them. And so that's what happened is this clinical psychologist ended up doing basic research all the way down to what is a word. And, uh, and the whole community has picked that, uh, picked that up. Now, when I present it in terms of ACT products and so forth, if I said to the world out there, you got to understand all behavioral principles plus amplified by RFT and evolutionary science in order to do ACT, I might as well just, you know, build a, a castle wall and a moat around this applied work. And I didn't think that was right. So what has happened is people come in, it's kind of like a Trojan horse act. It's kind of cool and you know, it kind of sounds neat and the, the language isn't too hard and you, you see changes in yourself and others. But then right in there, in the books themselves, are these kind of connections to these basic learning processes, operant and classical conditioning and relational learning processes, symbolic learning, bidirectional and combinatorial uh, relational framing. And then they start asking questions like, what's that? So it, it, you know how Amazon has all those links? You used to be able to see it. You could go and, and look at People who bought this also buy that. Mm -hmm. You can still see it, but it's down after the, after you say they bought this ACT book, they also buy other ACT books. Now that's what it says. If you go a little deeper into it, you start seeing they buy books on behavioral principles. They buy books on RFT. And I'm pretty sure I've sold more books on the ABCs of behavior than, uh, than almost anyone in ABAI world who says that's what needs to happen. Because the way you reach people is through their hearts and their direct interests, and then show that the basic principles will help amplify that. But now in terms of walking through, you know, the point by point, there's arguments about that. People in the, the uh, CBS community, some of them don't like middle level terms, and they think that's really a big problem or that they're hypothetical constructs, which they're not. But, uh, and we could have that discussion. Uh, I can give you a couple quick ones just to show you how easy I think it is to make the linkage. And then there's the research program of building it out. Diffusion, I think, is just a way of talking about uh, deliberate uh, manipulation of the transformation of stimulus functions through relational operants. And you can do it by all kinds of paralinguistic cues, you know, by repeating a word, by saying words backwards, by saying them in funny voices. And you know, some brilliant work by Carmen Luciano, other major kind of basic behavior analysts showing that these very tight lab manipulations of exactly how rules are presented can augment or diminish their stimulus control over uh, other behavior. Well, that's the transformation of stimulus functions effect. The sense of self that we go after inside uh, act of this I hear now awareness that comes from dictic relational frames of I, you, here, there, now, then. We now know that because we can take uh, children who don't have that uh, sense of self and we can augment it. The data suggests there's still more there. A theory of mind is not simply verbal. That's one thing. And there's more to it in perspective taking than simply those three uh, relational frames. But uh, it's a big part of it, and there's pretty good measures now of um, these kind of perspective-taking frames and how, and how central they are in uh, language development. Uh, if I could 
jump to another one would be values. I mean, values are motivative augmentals. They're rules that uh, alter what functions as reinforcers for people. And, uh, you know, we've done work on how uh, rules alter, have this function altering effect. And some of it is that you're connecting into things that are already reinforcers. And uh, if you just look at how you've responded when you've been treated by people in particular ways, like if you think of who your heroes are, who your guides are, who lifts you up in your life. And I bet you when you do that, you're going to find that there's something in the way they are with you that you value. And if you could put that into your behavior, could we create kind of a, an intrinsic reinforcer, a natural reinforcer? And this goes back to Charlie Furster's work on arbitrary versus natural reinforcers. Can we build that by the use of relational operants? And I think the answer is yes, because we get to care about things like justice and freedom and equality and, and you know, having a world that uh, will be livable in the, its environment for our grandchildren. You know, we will fight and die for things like, uh, uh, you know, treating people fairly or, uh, you know, making sure that we don't so pollute the world that uh, we can't live in it. The things that were in the first two pages are beyond freedom and dignity. You know, we will fight and die for those things. Uh, you know, you need a model of that. Non-human animals fight and die for their own survival in a very direct way, but we're able to fight and die for these kind of abstract qualities that we can put into our own behavior. And when you do that, it's a, you know, it's a powerful thing. You could be a Nelson Mandela locked into a cage and still be concerned about justice and about softening your guard's heart in a way that when you get out, everybody can see that you've been doing that work because you don't say, now it's time for to let the bastards pay. You know, if, if he had done what you and I might do, if you locked us up, uh, you know, there would have been blood in the streets when we were let out. But that's not what he was doing. So I think we need behavioral accounts of these profound human phenomena. And uh, RFT gives you the beginnings of one. I've just kind of done a brief touch on three of the flexibility processes, but I think I could do all six. And I can show you several RFT studies, rule government behavior studies, that are in this territory. But now if you want a really tight account in the sense of absolutely bottom up piece by piece, the whole community is still working on that. And um, I think by the time we've got that done, you know, applied behavior analysis is almost a direct expression of basic behavior analysis, which right now it's not. There's all kinds of things that you want to deal with that you don't know how to deal with. That's why all the BCBAs out there are, looking at things like ACT and so forth, because, for example, do we have a technology for dealing with private events? Skinner said we should treat them as behavior. Where's the technology? Yeah. Well, most people look and say ACT's about, probably about the best thing we got right now. The most behaviorally consistent, behaviorally developed. Now, are some folks who say, oh, I don't want to deal with private events. Okay, great. But then I don't understand what tradition you're part of. Because the one I was part of had quotes from uh, Skinner saying, yeah, but I'm interested in boring from within in that famous uh, symposium when he's talking about EG boring and why behaviorists are definitely interested in the private events and internal world of people and they're not just Watsonians. So uh, if, if you just say, okay, I'm not interested in private events, then uh, a, good luck. I hope your love relationships work out well and stuff. B, <laughs> I wonder what you do when your clients cry in front of you. What do you do when your client says that, you know, their life has no meaning and purpose? You just refer them out to a social worker? Is that what you're doing? And if you don't have a language to talk about that, guess what you're going to say? If you're going to say anything, you're going to say mentalistic stuff that came directly out of your culture. So that's not where we should end up. As a field, behavior analysis. That's a great point. That that almost bears repeating. You know? So basically, you're going to default to something that is uh, that that's that's rather unscientific and unhelpful, basically. Yeah, out of not knowing and what the hell else to do. Not knowing what else to do, and I, and I, you know, I get we need to know what else to do, but we've allowed that 
a little bit too much emphasis on that. And it's in the, the kind of the white bookization and the BCBSization of our tradition. Go back and read Skinner and you don't see that. You see all forms of human action or behavior, all forms, including thoughts and feelings and memories and bodily sensations. And so let's get a science to catch up with that philosophical aspiration. And um, that's the, the row I've been hoeing for my 71 years. Got it. Got it. Um, all right. So I think that kind of clears up some of the kind of basic principle questions that, that I had. Yeah. Uh, I had a few others, but I think you kind of answered them in, in, the, in the process of going through some of these other things. So uh, what I'd like to do, because I've been reading a lot about the experiences of not only BCBAs, but, you know, frontline behavior technicians, RBTs and the like, and the, this theme of, of burnout yeah. is something I keep hearing more and more about. And obviously you've spent the last 30, 40 years training clinical psychologists and yeah. I have to imagine clinical psychology and perhaps some of the other helping professions have been, are, are no strangers to the stressors of, of, sure. of, of, you know, these types of things and have been dealing with burnout as well. And so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering just more generally if those types of professions are, are, are ahead of the game. Um, but even more, more fundamental than that is, you know, what, what is burnout from, from your perspective and how, how does it differ from just general everyday stress? Yeah. Uh, I, I know you've done a, a, a couple of studies on, on sure. this. Uh, and so if you can talk about burnout from the, from the, from your perspective, that would be great. That would be great. Yeah, there's, there are several studies showing that that could be helpful with burnout. In fact, this new book, A Liberated Mind, if somebody's listening and is struggling with burnout, you, you could do a lot worse than to pick it up uh, because it will walk you through the science of psychological flexibility, which is kind of almost the anti-burnout uh, model. And um, that's true correlationally, but it's also true experimentally. You can, when you apply these processes, they tend to undermine a burnout, you know, the components of burnout usually include this sort of sense of a lack of personal accomplishment, a sense of emotional exhaustion, and some sort of sense of depersonalization or cynicism or objectification and dehumanization of others. And, you know, that process, it isn't just stress. I mean, the data on stress are, are that stress is really not itself harmful it's stress resisted fought with and handled poorly that that's harmful after all what we're doing right now is this exciting or stressful it's you exciting know, to me <laughs> it's exciting to me and if you were just look physiologically you'd probably say it's stressful in some sense we're i mean exercising is that stressful if we look at your body you'd say yeah sure of course it is but it does not experience that way so when people say stress they usually mean this burden of, of demands, work demands, social demands, etc., that clicks into an attitude of this is beyond me, this is too much, I can't have this, and a, a kind of a space that's avoidant, judgmental, defensive, protective. Psychological inflexibility is really the core of that space. And what we've shown is that uh, if you can flip the... The, the process is over and the one that's more emotionally and cognitively open, more centered in being present here in, in your world, uh, externally and internally, and bringing values into the next moment as a quality of your actual action, uh, not as an outcome or a goal or achievement, but as a quality of your action, of adding in those adverbial qualities of lovingly or compassionately or creatively uh, doing what you're doing, you know, uh, burnout tends to have a hard time surviving in the face of those kind of flexibility processes. So um, I, I do think it's a kind of an epidemic. You see it in the Western world and it's a sign that we've climbed into a way of being in our work life that is avoidant, uh, judgmental and that fails to touch the processes that lift us up as human beings. And there I'm back to private events. 
The other cost of not having a good analysis of private events in terms of dealing with the people that you deal with, the parents that you're dealing with, the clients you're dealing with, is that your own work life is full of reactions of that kind. And if you have no healthy way of dealing with with private events in the lives of others, what are you going to do with those private events in, in your own life? When you're feeling exhausted, when you're feeling judgmental, you know, if you do the, like the mass lack personality, uh, uh, rather mass lack personnel, bur burnout inventory, the best known uh, self-report instrument of burnout, it has these three scales of emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, uh, a lack of personal accomplishment. And, if you had to pick a single item on there that accounts for the most variance, it's something like an item that goes something like, as a result of my work, uh, I feel more callous towards other people. Well, you know, how did that happen? How did you get to the point to saying yes to that? Like, is there another way that you could interact with that next client of yours or that next employee of yours that you need to move along or whatever? in such a way that uh, callousness, which I, I think of as a metaphor for defensiveness, after all, we have calluses where we repeatedly are challenged physically in, in our own skin, uh, and we kind of cover over and make insensitive so that you can't hurt me, you can't touch me, you can't harm me. That's the metaphor of a callous. Yeah? Mm -hmm. How did we get there? And I, I think we got there by these one step at a time processes of defending ourselves emotionally, walling ourselves off through judgmental uh, 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 cognitions or, or symbolic uh, language. And um, ACT will help you uh, sort of uh, polish off the callous, calluses that you can feel again, but without being overwhelmed by feelings that you can think more flexibly without being overwhelmed by them. And uh, I think that's what we need in order to be able to step into the challenges of our work. BCBAs are asked to do enormously hard things, emotionally, cognitively, physically, behaviorally hard things. And you better have uh, some ways of being with your own uh, and private behavioral processes or they're going to bite you as a result. So I have a few questions related to this. If I'm, a, let's see, um, a supervisor, I'm in some, some sort of supervisory role mm -hmm. and I have, in, you know, meetings um, intermittently with yeah. the staff members that work with me. W what are some, obviously in staff meetings, there's business to be done. There's, you know, the housekeeping that re that's sure. required to keep an organization running smoothly and whatnot. So time is of an essence. <laughs> Uh, and there's not a, a ton of it oftentimes. Um, so given those constraints, what would be some things that you would recommend that supervisors do to prevent uh, burnout or at least to help yeah. employees manage stress and things like that? Well, I, um, be careful about managing stress because it sort of sounds like stress is the enemy and you've got to manipulate it or manage it. It's not the enemy. And if you, uh, if you change your relationship to stress, it may actually be the thing that gets you up out of the bed in the morning, really wanting to go to work. Uh, it, it's very close to the same thing. But, uh, but I take your question to be like, what do you do in the hurly burly quick uh, world of, uh, of a behavior analytic practice to help uh, avoid burnout as the outcome? And that you're That's kind of, precisely it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Here are the kind of things that are, it's covered in a liberated mind actually. One is take a little bit of time to take the perspective of others. It doesn't very hard for to really allow a space in your work team meetings, for example, for the quiet person to speak, not just the one that always speaks, or to really understand that from the other person's point of view and to ask a few questions that amplify that. Like, what's really hard about that? What shows up for you just emotionally when you do that? And asking that question. There's pretty good data on leadership, you know, transformational leadership styles, et cetera, that show that a person who's willing to find out about some of those details of their workers is seen as a more human uh, and encouraging kind of 
a, a boss, but it also, if you yourself model that by sharing a little bit of what, what's going on with you internally, not as a dump, but as a share, this um, uh, values conversation, you know, what do you really care about? What do I really care about? Not as objects and outcomes, but as qualities of action. And then can we as a whole group get clear about what do we care about as a group, as a team? How do we want to treat each other? And can we begin to sort of notice, are we doing that? Or are we slipping over into, you know, judging each other or uh, avoiding each other or whatever the thing might be? We've linked up the psychological flexibility processes with uh, Lynn Ostrom's Nobel Prize winning design principles for creating small groups that foster cooperation, which is your challenge. And if you were to come to an app boot camp for behavior analysts, you would have at least a few hours of training in ProSocial, which is the combination of those two things. If you go to prosocial.world, just the word prosocial with a period and then the word world, you'll see what we're trying to do. And there's a book coming out in October that sort of scales the behavior analytic work on relational operants and acceptance and commitment therapy up into the evolutionary science work of Lynn Ostrom's design principles. And you'll see a whole bunch of things you can do very directly, make perfect sense if you're an OBM person under something and something about organizational behavior management, about how to put into your work teams uh, these Ostrom design principles, in addition to the kind of acceptance, diffusion, and values work at the level of the individual and the group that we also put into this package called ProSocial. So I'll be giving you a couple indications, but also some places to go to, to get additional resources. And even before that second book uh, or that additional book comes out, you can find a lot at prosocial.world that will support you in uh, exactly these moments that you're talking about. Are you ready to make the leap from pen and paper into the digital world? Or are you frustrated by your current system? Well, I recommend you go check out Go Lotus. Go Lotus was created by a product development expert who spent years building systems for Apple and Microsoft before her child was diagnosed with autism. But creating Go Lotus, she had one mission in mind create a platform that could help therapists better treat their kiddos by providing a tool that allows them to focus on the actual work and not the paperwork. Go Lotus is an intuitive, easy to use, and dare I say beautiful system. It handles every aspect of practice management from data tracking and automatic soap notes to scheduling and billing. It's so simple your entire team can be up and running in less than an hour. For more information, go to golotus.com forward slash register. And by using the promo code MATT, the first 100 people will receive 90 days of our data trackers completely free. And by signing up, you'll then receive an additional 25% off the first 12 months. So again, for more information, head on over to golotus.com forward slash register. Great, great. Um, and I will uh, have that website listed in the show notes for this episode. So folks can go to behavioralobservations.com and look for Stephen Hayes and it will be there. Um, so I get what you're saying in terms of preventative maintenance, if yeah. you will, right? So if we can take what you just suggested metaphorically as kind of like doing routine maintenance on your car to keep it running smoothly and whatnot. And that might not be the perfect metaphor, but uh, l l let's talk about what happens when the car is in the ditch. <laughs> so let's say I'm going to make up an example here, but let's say I just got hired as the clinic director, you know, for an agency, clinical director for an agency. And I'm right off the bat noticing that f folks are, are, are really, really burnt out and then we might need to pour some additional energies into addressing this. Um, obviously there's probably a whole host of, uh, I guess, uh, systems based things that, that, that might need attending to beyond act, but just from an act, you know, again, looking at things, you know, from an act perspective, what's, what, what would be some other things you can do for a, a pretty severe kind of inter or immediate intervention, uh, for some, uh, staff who are more or less fairly burnt out at that stage well if you're if you're going individually i mean i would sit and 
uh, with the employee where you, you're concerned and find out what they really care about. What do they really want? Have a values conversation first. Take the time to listen. You know, there's a lot of us who are dealing with people at work where, you know, we don't know the names of, the, of, of the, our coworkers' children. We don't know where they live. We don't know, you know, what their relationships are like, et cetera. And you wonder, like, well, really? Um, so have a conversation. And if you want to get into a, one that's important and kind of an anti-burnout one that is also uh, at the core, uh, it would be a values-based conversation. It would be good for you because you, as a supervisor, because you may see ways that some of those values are actually could be touched in the work environment itself with a tweaking of role or responsibilities or how the work tasks are handled. Um, you know, I think uh, uh, taking the time to take the perspective of the other person is really critical as well and being able to uh, you know, share a little bit about uh, your your own difficulties, so people don't feel as though they're they're completely disconnected from the people around them. They're the worst. They're the you know people criticize themselves strongly and then defend themselves in a kind of narcissistic, prideful way. But really, it's because they're feeling as though they're not doing well uh, when they're in entering into that burnout kind of uh, space. Uh, you will find in the prosocial.world some ways of actually having a pretty interesting staff meeting by focusing in on the design principles and, and um, applying some of these. So uh, it isn't just preventative, it's also ameliorative. And um, uh, we've uh, used these methods in uh, groups that are in high level of conflict in organizational work. And, and what you'll find if you explore it is a lot of this stuff makes perfect behavioral sense. I'll give you an example. Um, there has to be a fair distribution of costs and benefits. There has to be uh, some sense in which people are together in how we make decisions here. And it doesn't have to be a democracy necessarily, but they have some say in, in, in how we do that. There has to be monitoring of the steps were taken that are positive and negative and contingent actions, but the contingent actions need to be scaled, especially on the negative side. They need to be scaled in ways that start very small and grow only over time, giving people a chance to correct. Those are all Ostrom design principles, a part of what she won the Nobel Prize for in 2009 in economics when she showed that uh, indigenous peoples can protect their common pool resources, their forests, lakes, rivers, fisheries, streams, etc., very well, but only if they follow these eight principles. Well, I've just given you three that any behavior analyst would say, yeah, that makes sense. You know, uh, you know, the reinforcers that come should sort of fit. Don't be letting just, you know, you look inside our work teams. Sometimes people with little pushback, little counter control are asked to do way too much. And you got other people who are obviously showing an ability to sort of be lazy and, and slough off their tasks, but have been around longer and have more power inside the group doing way too little. That's toxic, dude. That's just a bad way to run your work team. And what it's modeling is, uh, you know, what we're really about here is uh, abusing people without power. Uh, people don't like to be abused. And if I'm a low-level staff and, it, and I'm being tagged and criticized, but I see around me other people are being selfish, boy, you better correct that because you've got a cancer inside your group that will eventually take the whole group down. And I think most behavior analysts running a business would know that, but they wouldn't see the link between the selfishness of that supervisor over there, for example, and the burnout of this uh, line staff member over here. Ostrom helps, helps us see that. And I see. So I, I'd suggest, again suggest the website, but you, you'll see that it's just, it almost feels like common sense. But when we rate, one of the things we do in, in the ACT Boot Camp for Behavior Analysis is we have people rate their work teams on you know, how well they're functioning, how much they feel supported, et cetera. And then we have them rate them on the ACT processes and the core design principles. And the correlation between those things and the outcome, the impact on you is something like 
across the group when we have the whole group do it in, in boot camp. So it's it's kind of like the teams that are doing well have figured out a way to manage these flexibility and Ostrom processes and the pe- teams that aren't ha- haven't. And um, that's true in our work teams. It's also true in our social groups. We have people rate those too and the same thing applies. So advantage of that science and do a better job. So we've been talking about this from the perspective of the supervisor or, you know, the manager or what have you. Let's say you are the employee and you're in one of these yeah. situations that doesn't have it figured out. Um, yeah. You know, and, and I, I guess there's kind of two ways to look at how to manage, a, you know, an un, you know, a, a dysfunctional work environment. A, a, sure. One would be, you know, digging deep into your values and, you know, connecting with what remaining aspects of the job that you truly care for. One of the, I spent a lot of time consulting in public schools and, you know, we could do a gazillion podcasts on the, you know, uh, the mismanagement that you see there frequently or just some of the, 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 not, not through anyone's direct doing, but just the structure of those, those, those systems sometimes are very challenging to work in. Um, but you know, oftentimes I hear from teachers like when I can get in and I can be just with my kids and not, you know, no one's bothering about the curriculum or this or that or the other thing. Uh, that's when I'm happiest. So you know, it would be a situation of someone kind of connecting with their values, I suppose, um, and, 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 and such that it helps them to persevere through some of the other kind of not so fun aspects of their job. Um, so I, could, I, I I'm, I'm guessing a case could be made for, for doing that under less than ideal circumstances. But at the same time, what I, I, I I'm yeah. also cautious about having people do that to such an extent to which they quote unquote persevere exactly. indefinitely in an environment that, that is, that is extracting some toll. And I guess what I'm curious is from your perspective, Steve is, you know, how, how, how would you, how would you coach someone to kind of find the balance between those two? In other words, you know, what, yeah. what are some things to, 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 what are some signposts along the way? It's like, okay, uh, I can either do this and this is optimal for, for me, or I have to cut bait and actually look for a new job. Well, you know, there's no formula here, but one of the things I'd point to inside the flexibility processes that are relevant, you mentioned this thing of, can I actually put values-based behaviors into my day? And can I do it in a way that uh, allows me to uh, maintain this uh, psychologically flexible stance? If I can do that in a work environment that's hostile, the data are pretty clear. When you're able to do that, it increases the sense of personal accomplishment, decreases burnout. That does not mean, though, that the environment is unimportant. Uh, In the very, very first study we ever did in the modern era, I say we, with Frank Bond and his uh, student, Bond and Bunce 2000, after this long hiatus when I was working on relational frame theory, psychological flexibility measures, uh, uh, functional contextualism, philosophy of science, you know, from the early studies done in the early 80s, it was almost uh, 15, 16, 17 years before I went back to outcome studies because I thought we needed to work out the processes. But the first one in the modern era, uh, Frank Bond went into a work environment with uh, call workers in a bank, you know, this horrific thing where they have to call people up who haven't been paying their bills and stuff like that. Call after call, they're getting hung up on, shouted at, et cetera. It's just a nightmare job. And uh, they had a, 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 a treatment condition in which people would reduce stress in their workplace by taking arms against the uh, way the work environment is arranged and have been previously validated kind of a behavioral method, or they try to act. And what happened is act produced much greater impact on workplace stress and burnout. But the other thing that happened is by, not immediately, but by follow-up, the people who've been through the act training started demanding changes at work at just as high a level, if not higher, as the ones who were trained to do that to, so as to avoid stress. And so what, here's what that tells me. It tells me that what's standing between you and doing what might be done in the work environment you're in is very likely private events. You're afraid. You're not comfortable challenging your boss. You're having thoughts like, oh, I'm going to be fired, etc. Et so you get stopped in place and then the work 
environment doesn't change, can't change because the workers themselves aren't, unless you're just lucky. Uh, so, so there's that piece of, that you just mentioned, but it's a little more elaborated than just a values conversation. Then the other piece I'd want to say in response to what you're saying is, and even then, compared to what? I mean, you, uh, if you're in a, a work environment that uh, is just hostile, et cetera, or maybe it takes you hours and hours to get there, or, you know, they're not giving you very good working conditions, you're not getting paid very much, and on and on it goes. Well, what's standing between you and getting a new job? And, and probably likely somebody's going to say, well, and they're going to point to private events. They're going to say something about how they're afraid, that the job may not work out, uh, you know, maybe they're not good enough, maybe they won't be wanted, maybe, you know, the, the, the experience of being rejected after you put in your application is so painful, I mean, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what we've actually found is if you take something like um, kind of as a model for this, people who, let's say, who are in domestic violence uh, situations where really what they need to do is leave that relationship. It's an abusive relationship. Now, we, you can't go in there guns up blazing and say person by person you should leave. That may not be the thing to do. In some of these cases, we might be able to do something about the relationship. But in many circumstances, you need to leave. But people don't feel able to. And what we've shown is that, you know, with the kind of act work, people are more able to because they're more able to walk through those emotional cognitive uh, barriers and with their values as a focus, create new behaviors and new, uh, you know, take steps like leaving an abusive relationship, leaving a job that just doesn't work for you. So I would really spend some time deeply exploring what do you really want? what stands between you and making a change. And if you find yourself sort of living inside uh, a kind of thing where, you know, if I just hold my breath long enough, uh, it'll all go away. Well, that's true as far as we know. In the end result, we're, it's all a big ice ball. And if you hold your breath long enough, uh, eventually we'll all uh, be horizontal. However, meanwhile, you got a life to live. Is this where you want to be? And if the answer is no, really look at, well, what's keeping you there? Is there a change you can make inside it? If not, what would you have to be willing to experience to be making those changes outside of it? And uh, I think what you'll find in either case is that these inflexibility processes narrow the range and the flexibility processes broaden the range. So my recommendation comes back. I'm sorry to be a one trick pony, but it just so happens that when you do the 10% that does the 80%, uh, 80% of the things you say to me, I can point back to the 10% because it's central. It's right inside uh, being stuck in a job and not leaving is uh, these same kind of private events are functioning as a barrier, a barrier or not making changes that are needed. Same thing. Well, uh, thank you for kind of expounding on that, Steve, because I know, that's going to be helpful to many listeners uh, uh, who are tuning in. Um, so uh, I want to turn back just to kind of the supervisory process for a yeah. minute. And I, I suspect the answers <laughs> might, 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 might echo some previous ones, but uh, I want to get back to coaching employees to improve their performance. Um, you know, I think a lot of, you know, for if, especially if someone is kind of, uh, you know, by nature conflict uh, averse, yeah. um, it's going to be, it, it might be hard to kind of point out some of the, you know, performance challenges. Uh, and, and especially, you know, uh, there are folks that, especially if you have a conflict averse person trying to supervise someone who is, you know, uh, the opposite <laughs> of, of that. And you might be, you know, what you might call a strong personality or a, you know, quote unquote yeah. difficult person or what have you. Again, I'm just using these terms sure. you know, kind of colloquially here. Um, what, what suggest if you're, if you're a supervisor in that role and you know, you're, you're, you're reluctant to give that, that feedback. What, what are some suggestions you might have for that person in that situation? Well, something you might do is, is really think about what are the establishing operations for the things that we do? And, you know, underneath, and this is in the liberated mind, first place I really laid it out, 
thoroughly underneath these inflexibility and flexibility processes, both, I think there's six major establishing operations. I call them yearnings, um, which is the yearning to belong, to feel, for things to be coherent and fit together, to be oriented, to be able to uh, seek out meaning by kind of personal choice, have some role in what's of importance, and uh, to be able to be competent at achieving that. Well, those establishing operations are inside the problems you see. Can you put them inside the solutions that you see? So, for example, uh, you take something like the yearning for belonging yeah, but what happens with people is they start trying to belong by being special, by the stories they tell about how special they are. And deep inside that story is usually a comparison to others and usually a negative one. And so you know that you've seen this at work. The person that you're challenging, I bet you, has a friend at work and they're saying the same thing. They're, they're supporting each other on, oh, how lousy this is because, and there's a long story. There's a whole lot of verbal behavior being admitted around how you're not a good supervisor or this isn't a good workplace or this isn't fair or we should do it this way and they're not listening to us. That whole little culture that starts dividing up work teams, right? Yeah, but it also produces belonging. It produces belonging. Now, you're in a little sub-community of belonging, yeah? But it's your job as a supervisor, and especially if you're in charge of a larger unit and stuff, to think about how can I create belonging inside a pro-social work team? And if I'm seeing this kind of dividing off, this kind of difficulty, noticing this and sort of sniffing out what the underlying establishing operation is is critical because it tells you what the reinforcers are. And, it, and if belonging is a reinforcer, let's – let that happen inside. So, for example, can you actually arrange conditions in which, uh, you know, access to the group, your role in the group, you know, is uh, it depends upon stepping forward in a pro-social way. We do this in, with our kids all the time or our schools all the time. You know, somebody gets the privilege to be able to do the morning announcements because they've – and I've looked at the the – the schools that are out there, for example, they're using the AIM protocol, the ACT protocol for schools that Mark Dixon has put out there. And it's this very cool contingent thing where people get to do that special thing as a result of what? As a result of them stepping into, in their special needs classroom, some of these same process work on diffusion, acceptance, and values work. So you use it as a a larger reinforcer. You could do the same thing in your work team. I could go and, um, I, if I did it, it'd take quite a long answer, but I could go through all six of those yearnings I've talked about, link them up to an inflexibility process that you see when problematic workers and to a flexibility process you see when the thing is really working well. And the, the uh, subtitle for this new book is called How to Pivot Towards What Matters. And the metaphor of a pivot is that we've got these repertoire narrowing processes that have smaller sooner reinforcers dominating over larger laters, but are linked to this underlying establishing operation, such as belonging, how, belonging, my specialness, and telling my story. But then next thing you know, I'm lying. I'm aligning with people to, to create subgroups. And I'm going to take that energy and I'm going to put it in a different direction. In this case, in the act work, I'm going to put that belonging inside conscious connection between people and the ability to sort of notice and describe your own reactions and hear and understand the reactions of others. Um, so uh, I think we can do the same thing with each of these. And the, uh, let, let's, let's just add one more just to give a little more of a sense. People are yearning to be competent. They want to be competent. I mean, little babies come out spending hours and hours and hours just trying to figure out how to make a, a, a you know, reach a reach an object or open a box or, or, or you know, make a, a mobile above their crib move or whatever. And so how did it come to be that these, you know, grown up folks in your staff don't want to learn anything? Well, I think they do want to learn something, but you're going to have to find a way to make it more game-like, more fun, and more linked to what they deeply care about and what you care about. So that values conversation individually and in the team, and then linking it up to 
this more playful trial and error kind of deal where instead of springing forth from the head of Zeus being thoroughly competent, that's what, you know, our verbal systems tell us that's where competence comes from. You know, if you've ever been in supervision, you know, you only want to show the good tapes. You don't want to show the bad tapes. Mm. You don't want to show the places where you don't know. But guess what? Trial and error learning requires variation and selection to operate not just on the positives, but also on the negatives. You have to, you know, have differential reinforcement or reinforcement doesn't work. Uh, You know, otherwise eating candy from morning to night would mean everybody would be behaving great and it's not going to happen. Well, okay. What, What would we have to do to kind of take this verbal process of, Uh, I will get to be competent by uh, instantly achieving, which leads to either procrastination or pretense, and instead get people into this humble trial and error process of doing the best we can and learning from our mistakes and getting better and better. Uh, So some of these other things of the values work, acceptance work, perspective taking work, loosens things up a little bit so that people can learn the way um, operant learning actually happens, which is variation and selection. It doesn't happen just by, here's the rule, and then you do it, and then everybody applauds. And so uh, I think there's a the problem isn't the yearning for competence. It's there. It's sort of inborn. It's that it got hijacked by this verbal process that tells you that you shouldn't have to do it uh, in ways that include any mistakes. Have a conversation with your employee and model it yourself. For example, ask for feedback about the mistakes you're making. Real feedback, genuine feedback, and listen. Don't just be saying, here's some feedback I need to give you. How about some feedback you need to receive from them? And take it seriously. And, of course, some of it will be accurate, some of it won't. That's okay. Same thing with your feedback. It's not 100% to be Uh, treated as the truth. So that's kind of an example, and it's something that's in a liberated mind. We're really walking through what the establishing operations that underlie both the problems we see and the opportunities they provide for growth. Awesome. Um, All right, so we've been talking about supervision uh, for a while here. I I have um, an an ethics-based question, and uh, as I'm sure you're Mm -hmm. aware, uh, we spend a lot of time in our uh, preparation, become BCBAs, uh, talking about ethics and, and uh, ethical uh, dilemmas and how to resolve them and things like that. Uh, what can ACT contribute to uh, the, the um, um, e- ethical practice, if you will, uh, also, in, in, you know, um, in terms of the, the study of ethical behavior and ethical decision-making and things along those lines? I think it's a great question. And, uh, you know, this, the thing that I would point to is the single biggest thing might help is the perspective taking piece. Because if you really look at our ethical restrictions, often they, they're a failure to take into account the interests of, un, of others and the tendency to sort of ride over the interests of others. And uh, we need to kind of put hold our interests in check in the context of interests of others. So that skill of being able to take the perspective of another and to be able to look at it from their particular background, culture, role, situation, and to make sure you don't get into dual roles or to a power relationship or absence of counter control, the kinds of things that can lead to ethical dilemmas. Uh, That would be a a particular example of, of a place where taking the perspective of others and being able to respond with some sense of empathy and connection to their situation uh, makes it a lot harder to just go insensitive to how your impact, your behavior could impact the, the lives of others in a negative way. Okay, great. Um, all right. Just got a one or two more questions here. And I know we've been referencing the book uh, here and there throughout our conversation. Um, so, I had some questions about the, I guess the writing process for this one in particular. Yeah. You know, you, you've written over 40 books, which is yeah. mind boggling. I, I, um, 
And so, uh, you know, and we started getting into this before we hit the record button. And, <laughs> and uh, I, I want to make sure we got some of it on tape here. Uh, you know, so what, what Steve, is the, was the motivation for writing yet another book? Uh, yeah. who, was the, who was the, you know, what problem, you know, were you, or set of problems were you trying to solve? And, and, and who, who really is the, the intended audience for a liberated mind? Yeah, this one is my the first big five book I've ever done. Big five meaning there's five big publishers. The one I went with controls 50% of the industry in trade publication. Trade publication means the kinds of things that will show up in your bookstore, uh, drug stores or grocery stores or air, air uh, 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 kind of uh, uh, on your way to the airplane. Um I thought it was important to try to put the fruits of this 40 year journey towards psychological flexibility, understanding rule governance, language, et cetera, that's part of the CVS journey that I've been on. And it isn't very often that behavior analysts have sort of got a, a crack at the plate of that. I mean, occasionally people will have books with the big five, uh, but usually it's very uncommon. And, and, uh, if you actually look, it's important that you get a big enough advance, et cetera, that they really feel as though their rear end is on the line, so they will do everything they can to market the book and so forth, which is really what the game is here. I've been lucky enough because of just what's happened in my life that, you know, Act got some big publicity, you know, and Get Out of Your Mind Into Your Life went up to number 20 on the Amazon list and beat Harry Potter for one glorious week. It was because Time wrote a six-page story on it. And... You know, in terms of behavior analysts, the last one before that was the story on B.F. Skinner. It's not very common that we get in there. So I worked for 11 years to produce this book. I have the original proposal from 11 years ago. I worked intensively for the last five. It turns out that in order to be able to do this, to get big five attention, there's the whole thing you need to do. It's called platform building. And so if people watch me from the outside and say, I wonder why Steve Hayes is doing a TED Talk. Or, I wonder why Steve Hayes is working on his Twitter feed. Or, I wonder why he's got this Facebook page. Or, I wonder why he did this online course. Or, I wonder why. It's because uh, I'm old enough to know that, uh, A, I'm not going to live forever. B, I'm in a situation that's kind of cool, that I've worked hard to get there. Not because I aspired to it. I, I just worked hard and got there. That's a better way to say it. And so I have an opportunity to do some things, I think, for behavioral psychology and for the world that, haven't, that aren't easily available. And, you know, I kind of got tired of going to ABA eyes and hearing the symposium. Why aren't they listening to us? What, why don't they act to change the world? Well, uh, <clears throat> instead of they, the word is us. What are we doing? The rat is always right, right? If we're not being listened to, how can we speak in ways that will be listened to? And how do we create that opportunity? A behavior analyst who reads a liberated mind, there's mind in the freaking title. Yet again, get out of your mind into your life and not liberated mind. There I am. But I'm sorry, excuse me for living. I've learned how to speak multiple dialects. And one of the dialects looks, quote, mentalistic, unquote. It isn't. Every one of those terms, I'm ready to stop and sort of do a, be held to account behaviorally for it. But what I decided with this book is that I was going to try to tell the story of this science journey, my personal journey, do something useful for the readers and try to orient policymakers towards what we know from contextual behavioral science. And so you'll see pretty decent discussion of Skinner and what he brought to the table, what I think his limits were and where, how we've tried to go on beyond from them. But you'll see me trying to put behavioral psychology back where it belongs, which is at the mainstream of the culture. We, we, we know too many things. We have too many things to contribute to be pushed off in a tiny little cul-de-sac. And um, uh, I think that's kind of a, a tragic place for us to end up, uh, given that our tradition had such grand aspirations, you know, from rats to Walden too, you know, that we were going to be the ones who took high precision, high scope science all the way into the needs of human culture beyond freedom and dignity. I mean, you just look at those canonical books and that's what's there. So uh, I'm excited about a liberated mind because it's my crack at the plate 
And if I strike out or whiff, well, at least I gave it a good effort. You know, I did the best I could to try to bring some uh, current uh, behavioral science knowledge into the cultural conversations about how we treat ourselves and raise our kids and uh, how we uh, deal with our mental health issues and how we prosper. Well, I think one of the things I would say about it is that uh, it is uh, covers a, a quite a bit of ground um, because it talks about, as you mentioned, and as I've discovered having the book, it, you know, the application of these principles to all sorts of everyday challenges. So it's not focused on a particular population or anything like that. So this really strikes at the center of the, the bell curve of, of humanity. And, uh, you know, I, I think uh, you deserve a lot of credit for writing in a very accessible way, Steve. So and that, that's really hard to do. And it's really hard to do. I tell you, I had a professional helper, though. Uh, and so and without that, Emily Luce is her name. She worked with Lynn Ostrom in her book that uh, really had a role in making the core design principles available to people. And so I, I found a development editor and, uh, you know, uh, I paid her well to uh, just ride me like a horse. You know, do not let me say sentences that uh, God herself couldn't understand. You know, so because uh, I'm a geek, you know, I'm not a writer really, but I worked and worked, and we we spent three and a half years, I think, working on writing the book. Of five years in terms of proposing and all that, eleven years from the very beginning, but the last three and a half years have been really quite intensive and. Uh, if there's any good writing in there, I'll deserve a little bit of the credit, but I'll put Emily Luce in there as my uh, a bigger uh, credit. I see. That. That's, uh, that's very gracious of you. Um, so um, there's so many more questions I could ask, but I also want to be respectful of your time, Steve. So let me just close with this. So what's, what's next for, for Steve Hayes? I know you have this other book coming out as well. Uh, yeah. but you're just You're about to launch this book that, you know, is, uh, again, aimed at the bullseye of, of culture. Uh, where, where, where do you go from here, I guess? Well, I'm going to try to position contextual behavioral science in a way that lifts up evidence-based therapy more generally and essentially begins to heal the breach between behavior analysis and cognitive therapy, cognitive behavior therapy. Originally, those were two wings of the same group. AABT was there before ABAI. And, uh, you know, Todd Risley was a president of AABT. And uh, he wasn't the only one. I mean, so, uh, and no, we're not going to go back into the same organization. So that's not going to happen. That's not the point. The point is, there's an, a real deep alliance there. And if we can build that alliance and then move that whole effort underneath evolutionary science and then produce the products that come from that that are more open and uh, flexible. And, you know, one of the things behavior analysts do need to know, and fair warning, relational operants change everything. They change everything. Why? Because they operate back on other behavioral processes. That's an empirical fact. And so reinforcers can become punishers, you know, uh, antecedents change, consequences change. I mean, so we're on a journey. If the behavior analysis is willing to walk this journey, mainstream behavior analysis, they're essentially walking the journey that it won't be in exactly the same form, but that I, I walked in the contextual behavioral science work. And it's brought me to a place where I think I can see how we can use our processes and principles and our ideographic process-focused knowledge to uh, alter how behavioral science itself functions and where it fits in the, in the arc of the life sciences. And so in the time that I've got, uh, you know, that's what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to position behavioral science properly as best I can and to build what I view as the most progressive features of it and do it in a way that interconnects us with others and doesn't cut us off from others. We're not strong, you know, treating ourselves as, uh, you know, some sort of little special band. 
Uh, back in the day, I'd really hear these things repeated from the Harvard lab of we few, we happy few. I don't want to hear we few, we happy freaking few. I don't want to hear that ever again. <laughs> you know, there's no reason we should be few. And it's not happy to be few. And the world needs more from us. So time's up. Figure out a way. How about we many, we happy many? Time's up. Let's figure out a way to get into a genuine conversation with people who think very differently from us and have such confidence in our core assumptions and principles and seeking out the additional principles we may need that we can come into a conversation that really lifts them up, not by just being like us, but that uh, as in all genuine conversations, they're lifted up because each side of the conversation is open to being moved by the other. And I think we're at our best when we do that. And uh, so what's next for me, I guess, is kind of, that sound, kind of sounds like old man tasks of uh, trying to make a lot of what I've done many years ago relevant. And um, it probably means fewer grants and randomized controlled trials and studies and stuff. I think maybe it's time for me to let the younger people do that. Um, I'm still doing empirical work, but I can see the heavier lift for me is to do the uh, work in connecting and uplifting and uh, uh, envisioning. And so uh, these books that you're talking about are the beginning of that process. And then we'll see how far I go with that uh, in whatever time I'm allotted. Excellent. Well, speaking of time, thanks for spending some of that with me and by extension, the Behavioral Observations podcast audience. Uh, Steve Hayes, this has been a really fun conversation. Thanks so much. It's been awesome for me. And thank you for letting me uh, speak to you and to your audience who I care about so deeply and uh, hope that they find something of value in uh, this work that we're doing. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast. 